Hey guys, Juby Harrell here with Nyan Leadership. A few months ago, we did a video that talked about five ways to manage remote staff. We did the video because the pandemic was new to a lot of folks and remote situations were pretty new overall. With the pandemic ongoing as we go into our seventh or eighth month, I think at this point, it's kind of important to talk about more ways you can manage remote staff and best practices that we've discovered over the last few months and that folks are using that are working really, really well. So today we're talking about five more ways to manage remote staff. The first one's actually one we covered in the first video, but this is a little bit more of a deep dive, and that is to set up regular check-ins with your staff. It's extremely important now more than ever, now they're not co-located in the same office, to establish regular check-ins on a cadence with your staff. But I'm gonna clarify a little more here and talk about what to talk about in those check-ins. Obviously, you're gonna talk about work and what the tasks are on their plate, but focus on the staff. What do they need from you? What kind of support do they need from you on their end? What can you be doing more of or less of? Again, another, another tip that I mentioned in the last one was about micromanaging. You can get that feedback from your staff. If you're micromanaging them, they're not gonna be giving you very good work. So do that in one of the check-ins. Make sure that you're doing individual check-ins as well as group check-ins. So that way, if there are specific issues that are a certain employee is dealing with, that employee doesn't have to publicly announce that unless they really feel comfortable doing that. So establish regular check-ins and focus on the staff. Ask them how you can be of support, not just what have you done, what have you done this week. Number two, create and enforce as much as you can team norms around meetings and around video and audio best practices. What do I mean by that? What I mean is if you have a team of 10 people and eight of them are on audio only and no video, that's gonna seem like everyone's checked out. Make sure that everyone knows that this needs to be treated like it's a real meeting. Everyone who can be needs to be on video as often as they can be. Now, understandably, with schools being the way that they are right now and situations being somewhat volatile around the country, around the world, at home, it's, it might be kind of tough to actually enforce that on a regular basis. But as much as possible, try to make it known that you want that to be the case. The more folks are on video, the more that you know that they're engaged, the more that you know that they're actually at their computers and not just giving you the, oh, sorry I was on mute <laughs> excuse that everyone knows happens all the time. Number three, get creative and educate yourself on productivity tools that you can use remotely. There's a lot of free stuff out there right now. Google Keep, Evernote, Trello. These are all task management functions and applications you can use from your phone, on your email, all over the place. So take, take advantage of those things and they're all free. Evernote costs money, I believe, but the other two are, are free and there's a lot of other options out there like that. Do some research, find out what works for you and start implementing it. Don't be afraid to try a couple different things to see what works for you and your team. But the important thing is to make sure that you're always innovating, finding new ways to be more effective, more efficient, and to make sure your team members are communicating with you and you're communicating with them as clearly as possible so things can get done. That brings me nicely to number four, over communicate. Now, I don't mean send 100 emails a day. What I mean is over communicate verbally and try to under communicate by email. When you're remote, you get a ton of e ton more emails than you need to get. And that's not a good thing necessarily. You have an inbox full of 15 or 20 emails that could have probably been one that's over communicating the wrong way. However, when you're over communicating in terms of checking in, calling, checking in on things, see how things are going, see how you can be of support, again, focusing it on them and not about you, then you're just being there as a servant leader. And those are the best kind of leaders in terms of getting people to, pr to produce results. When they know that you're there for them and they know that you're, you're checking out on them, you're not micromanaging them, and they also know that you're being respectful of their inboxes because they have emails coming from you, coming from other team members, and probably other folks in the organization, and maybe outside of the organization, they know that you're there for them and that they can get their work done that much more efficiently. Otherwise, don't be surprised if they start ignoring emails from you if you send too many in the same day or in the same hour sometimes. Lastly, and certainly not least, is the mindfulness commute. Revisit the mindfulness commute that I talked about in the first video. If you remember, the mindfulness commute was the idea of separating your home life from your work life, even if you have a small space, creating a certain kind of a routine for yourself you can walk yourself through to separate that mentally at least, if not physically. What I mean by that is to be extra intentional now about creating that time for yourself, where you can separate work and home, but also to actually make it mindfulness time. Focus on things like meditation or mindfulness or centering that can actually bring you down from situations that may be causing you other anxiety or the ability to, inability to separate home from life, work life. The mindfulness commute is a very, very powerful tool. And if you use it properly, it can really, really change the way you do business and how you feel outside of work, outside of work. 
you want to be able to separate those two things. If you can't, if you can't turn off your work mind, you're going to be stressed out all the time and get more and more stressed out. Your sleep will suffer, your stress will suffer, and anxiety will suffer, and it's going to be a cycle. It's going to keep building on itself. But the more you start creating and being intentional about that, creating that time for yourself to come down from that day or to build up to that day, to separate your work and home life as much as you can, the better it'll be for you. And those habits will stay with you over time. It may be tough in the beginning, but over time, that time is going to become more and more and more important. And you'll see the results get that much faster and that much more effective. Now, there's a ton of uncertainty out there still right now. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or next week in terms of remote staff being able to move back to the office. And some companies, in anticipation of this, have just gone full-time remote indefinitely. While it's saving a lot of time and overhead, it's causing a lot of adjustment issues. Folks who planned in their heads that this was only going to last a week or two or even a month are now having to adjust permanently. And with kids back in schools, it's causing a lot of frustration across the board. If you or folks on your team need help making the adjustments, please feel free to reach out. I'd be happy to talk with you guys about creating a strategy to make sure that you're creating healthy routines for yourself, mentally, emotionally, and for your kids and family, and for your work. Feel free to reach out anytime. If you like this video, please hit the like button, hit subscribe to get notified of future videos, and hit that bell so we can let you guys know. I'd very much love to hear from you and find out more about what you want to see. So thanks again, guys. Take care and stay safe.